Dear all, I hope I hope you can hear me now, both uh, panelists and audience, and warmly welcome to this discussion, where I look forward to asking some tough questions from our participants. And today, discussing here with us, we have uh, Elina Kalpu, who is the Under Secretary of State for Development Policy in Finland, and Janine Alm Eriksson, who is the Secretary of State for International Development Cooperation at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Sweden, and also Sandra Kremer, who is the director for the EU Directorate General for International Partnerships. And my name is Lisa Lindström, and I work as a freelance journalist, mainly for the Finnish broadcasting company and the Swedish TV based here in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, actually, the rains are about to start here in, in Kenya now, and my internet has been a bit unstable today. So in case I drop out at some point, uh, please excuse me, I try to get back in as fast as I can. My job here is um, traveling around Africa and reporting on contemporary issues around the continent. And this job is very hands-on and I get to meet a lot of people, which is very amazing. And today here we do have an all-female panel, but I'm also very aware that this is an all-white panel. And I hope that I can bring some thoughts from the people I have met uh, here on the continent into this discussion also through my questions. Uh, I've been living here in Kenya now for three years and in my opinion there's been a big change both in how the media and how the politicians look at Africa. I feel like there is still however a lot of talk and not so much action, a lot of what and not so much how and I hope we can answer a lot of how questions today. But we only have an hour so, so I want to get moving because the hour will go very fast. Thank you so much to the uh, Nordic Africa Institute and the Swedish Finnish Cultural Center Hanaholmen for arranging this. And next, I want to give the uh, give the go ahead to Gunvor Kronman, who is the CEO of Hanaholmen. Thank you, Lisa, a lot, uh, and warmly welcome also here to wintry Finland with uh, sunshine and ice outside. Um, this is part two of uh, a reflection process that we started together with the Nordic Africa Institute with focus on Finland's and Sweden's priorities and strategies within the EU-Africa relationship. Today, uh, we continue to investigate if uh, possible to, and if yes, how to make the best use of a joint Nordic approach in supporting EU in its relation to the African continent. Uh, we started this reflection process uh, with a roundtable in November last year, where thought leaders from Africa and the Nordic region focused on what is needed to develop EU-Africa relation the coming years. In the future uh, relationship between EU and Africa, we cannot ignore the fact that the pandemic has in many ways taken economic, social and rights-based development backwards for the first time in decades. Looking at, for example, development aid, an important discussion about how we can decolonize aid is reshaping our relationships, not to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, also the fact that uh, we actually today have an all-white panel, as, as uh, our moderator was mentioning. As a result of the pandemic, also localization in the aid sector has taken place at an unforeseen pace. All this has consequences for our future relationships. Europe is carrying a historic, sometimes traumatic backpack in its relation to Africa, while other continents now building relations with Africa lack this heritage. One of my uh, conclusions in the roundtable discussion last year was the importance of including young voices in the Africa-EU dialogue, gender equality, getting children back to schools and improving the situation of girls and women has become even more a priority in the light of the steps backwards we've seen during the COVID crisis. At the same time, we also see authoritarian leadership taking advantage of and being strengthened in the shadow of the COVID pandemic. It's obvious that an African, as, as African economies develop, and populations grow, the role of African countries in the world politics and economics is also becoming more prominent. Having political and trade relationships with African countries is increasingly important to the European Union and to Finland and Sweden. We need to address how all this is done, as Lisa Lott, our moderator, was saying in her opening remarks. I'm looking forward to the insights and the comments that we will share in the coming hour. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Gunmor. And next, uh, Therese Shimana Magnusson, who is the director for the Nordic Africa Institute, would like to say a few words. Go ahead. Thank you, Lisa Lott and uh, Gunvor. Um, a very good afternoon to you all. My name is Therese Schemander Magnusson, and I'm the director of the Nordic Africa Institute. It is also my pleasure to give you a warm welcome to this second seminar in a series of reflective but also forward-looking dialogues on the role of the Nordics in the AU-EU uh, partnership process. And as Gunvor alluded to, the first seminar that we organized in November aimed at collecting the insights from both African and European thought leaders and policymakers on how the Nordics really could contribute to future EU-Africa relations, but also on the leadership needed to leverage an effective partnership on equal terms. The focus of today's seminar will be on how the political level can take these insights forward. It is promising that despite, but also probably due to the multiple crises we are experiencing across the world, that there is a regained interest in global solidarity, in the notion of togetherness, in the importance of connectivity within and between societies. Because we know that development is more than economic growth. We know that a society built on trust and meeting people's social needs is fundamental to meet the challenges we have ahead. Therefore, we chose to focus the discussions in November on the importance of establishing and also investing in a strong social contract. In times when globally agreed principles and wider international cooperation are being questioned, where national priority supersedes the collective good, our panelists expressed an urgent need to unpack the concept of the social contract. What defines a social contract in Africa today and how does it relate to enhancing social resilience? Because if we don't have this deeper knowledge, we will fail to capture the opportunities for sustainable societal transformation. The key message brought to the front by the panelists was how we need to better understand the different underlying mechanisms and context contributing to social cohesion in different societies. And moreover, two things were emphasized. One, that the era of selling development solutions is over. And two, that even though we, have, we are known for having a strong social contract here in the Nordic region, we should keep in mind that that contract had to be negotiated and molded together over time to become strong. Only by leveraging diverse knowledge and voices, by enabling the ability to act and to have influence on social transformation, will we meet the challenges we all have ahead of us. I'm now eager to hear what our panelists today identifies as critical issues to make the future collaboration between Africa and EU equal, inclusive and effective. Again, a warm welcome and back to you, Lizelot. Thank you so much, uh, Therese. As, as we heard, we're first going to hear um, some brief remarks from both uh, Janina Eriksson and Elina Kalpu about this, this um, uh, the policy note that was published, and then we're going to get into the discussion. So please, uh, Elina, you start. Go ahead with your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa Lott, and thank you, Gunvor and Teres. Uh, and it's indeed a great pleasure to participate in this, this discussion today, because it is today that the Finnish government has uh, approved the Finland's uh, Africa strategy, uh, which is a brand new uh, strategy uh, and a very action-oriented also. Um, I think its key objective is to encourage the Finnish society and all stakeholders to actually get interested in Africa and become active and to highlight what Africa is all about today. Um, over half of African countries are middle-income countries now. There's lots of talent and creative energy in Africa. Um, 
African countries are active internationally, as was already mentioned. Integration has advanced, stronger African Union, uh, continent-wide free trade, single digital market, uh, visa-free area. Africa can be a partner in strengthening rules-based uh, multilateral system. And um, there's at the same time, we know there's also fragility in more than half uh, of African countries now. Large areas suffer from growing poverty, inequality and instability, and COVID has turned back uh, the clock. Um, so the partnership, uh, our societies to be more present as partners in Africa's development and its success eventually uh, to build a better common future together. Uh, more bridges for uh, engagement. Uh, we know the EU has some historic baggage with Africa, uh, but I don't agree with those who say uh, that the EU is now doing less and somehow losing to others. Um, the EU may not be the fastest externally, um, but the EU and 27 member states are doing a lot and will do more and also support many international institutions that are engaged in, in Africa. The visibility problem uh, is being tackled now by the Team Europe approach and maybe the multifaceted EU has been so focused on issues that the solved part was a little bit forgotten. Africa's youth, uh, do they admire authoritarian way of governance, a closed societies that monitor them, a life without respect of human rights? I doubt it. Uh, it is uh, fair to ask, time is on whose side on values in Africa. I don't think African youth actually want very different things from what the youth in Finland or in other countries want. Uh, but societies can fail if expectations are not met. And, uh, and the November roundtable was definitely all about this with its very good conclusions also. Um, I believe uh, one of the most important things the Nordic countries can do is sharing how we gradually became more inclusive, competitive and sustainable societies. The Nordics were themselves poor developing countries before, Finland even a fragile state. Um, our historic trial and error and learning path raises interest among our African partners, how uh, Finland, for instance, became uh, Finland of today. What can we do um, and how? Uh, this was uh, the how element was underlined. Examples, democracy, we are doing more. A Finnish actor demo is doing more, our history of multi-party system and coalition governments and the need for parties to cooperate even when they disagree is of much interest. Um, research also shows that local and regional democracy are key. There's a lot of things going on in this area. Rule of law foundation for trust, a Finnish rule of law center was just established to strengthen rule of law and institutions in, uh, in um, developing countries. Supporting national dialogues and peace processes, we just established a peace mediation center within the foreign ministry. Um, the foreign minister, the CMI and others are active in Africa. Uh, Finland can do more to support crisis management too. Free civil society, a key issue. Uh, we support Finnish NGOs active in Africa, not only in providing services, but also helping African societies uh, to have a voice and to draw attention to problems that governments need to solve. Gender and human rights, SRHR, so that girls uh, can go to school and learn a job, support their tech, tech skills, very important. Education, of course, one of our priorities. Building back better and greener, bringing recovery from COVID and sustainable development uh, together. More resilient, modern, uh, circular economies, uh, green jobs, better health security. Digitalization, absolutely possible even in difficult conditions. Reaching people, providing services, supporting schools, corrupt free mobile banking across long distances, very important. Sustainable investments, grants are not sufficient for the SDGs. Lending and investments, blended funding, leveraging private funding uh, is needed. Companies, uh, corporate responsibility, finding sustainable and climate-wide solutions and investments, circular economy, digitalization, and so on and so forth. Innovating together, uh, bringing together research communities. 
strengthening budgetary systems and taxation for countries to eventually provide funding for their essential services. We Nordics, we're good at taxation. Food security to make sure young people do not need to move to ghettos. Connect poor farmers with value chains and markets to create income. Africa could be exporter of, of foodstuffs. And finally, uh, the Nordic Africa Institute uh, to understand Africa better. Uh, there's no one single big solution, I believe. Uh, new generations of well-educated, talented African leaders need to lead wisely, tackle corruption, and uh, uh, of course, uh, tackle weak institutions, strengthen institutions, build trust. This is something no other country can do on their behalf. The fundamental choice is theirs, not ours. But there's a lot of a uh, lot the rest of us can do uh, to support their very good efforts. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Elina. And now, please, Janin Alm Eriksson, your remarks. Thank you, and uh, thank you all of you for your remarks, and Elina for the list of tools that we can use to achieve. Uh, and I come with greetings from Stockholm, and I'm very honored to be invited to this event. More than one year after the COVID-19 pandemic was declared by the WHO, w, WHO, we still meet virtually, but hoping for to be able to meet physically soon. The pandemic is a powerful reminder that our world is interconnected. We cannot separate hate, health from wider issues in society, such as gender equality, education, rule of law, or the economy. The recovery demands a rights-based approach and needs to address underlying inequalities, weaknesses, and insecurities. The EU-AU partnership is instrumental in jointly advancing the building back better and greener for inclusive and sustainable societies. While government revenues are declining, the impact of climate change is accelerating, aggravating the impact of COVID-19 on stability, poverty and food insecurity. Thus, the climate uh, crisis has not gone away. We should be working within the EU and with partners in Africa to secure ambitious climate action. Together with our Nordic colleagues, we will strengthen our voices within multilateral and regional institutions. We are committed to work together in countries where, or where we are bilaterally engaged. Likewise, we expect the EU-AU partnership to bring this agenda forward. Our goal is to keep us on track to meet our obligations under the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. Human rights, democracy, and the rule of law are areas to which Sweden is very dedicated. In view of the negative global trends on democracy, my government has made it a priority to fight back, to establish a, establish a counter narrative to the democratic backsliding, an attempt that is reflected in all areas of our foreign policy under the heading of drive for democracy. We have increased our democracy support and we continuously stand up for democracy's defenders and institutions. The growing democratic deficit in parts of Africa, for example, very apparent in Tanzania and Uganda in connection with the recent election, is a major problem. We need to work closely within the EU, but also with other like-minded countries in the world and with UN institutions to tackle this situation. We hope that 2021 will be the year that lays the foundation for a broadened partnership with Africa, based on mutual interests, including priorities ranging from peace to green transition, from digital transformation to sustainable growth. Sweden will continue to advocate the norms and principles of democracy, human rights, and sustainable, inclusive economies which are key for stronger social contracts, should permeate the EU-Africa partnership. The EU and Africa share many challenges and opportunities, including a pandemic that has had devastating effects on lives and economies around the world. 
Sweden recently announced uh, that it's doubling its contribution to COVAX, Global Vaccine Access Initiative, to ensure safe and effective vaccine are accessible also in low and middle income countries. However, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic goes beyond the immediate crisis and will continue to challenge also in the longer term. This further accentuates the need for more ambitious partnership with Africa where sustainable economic recovery to build back better and greener will be imperative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Therese. So now we can finally get to the discussion. And I saw that one, someone had already asked, why is this an all white panel? I can only say uh, my, my thoughts on that, but I think this is because we only have a short amount of time and now we want to pressure uh, pressure answers from Finnish and Swedish and EU leaders on how how we can, uh, how the Finnish and the Nordic countries, Finnish, Finland, Sweden and the Nordic countries can can contribute to Africa. Maybe next time we can have a, an all African panel who can answer and, and say what Africa can bring to the table for the Nordic countries, perhaps. But first I want to, to ask my first questions, question to Elina Kalku. There's a lot of talk about the social contract and, and what the Nordics can do for Africa. But when you've been speaking to your African partners, what is it that they wish for you to bring to the table when it comes to this? Is there a risk that, uh, that you know, we just try to impose a model that works for us without being sensitive to the African context? I think, Liz, a lot. Um, uh, the observation I've made over years, actually, is that there's so much interest on how the Nordics became Nordics, that this is probably the single most uh, important and interesting uh, discussion they are looking for. Uh, what were the mistakes we made? How we ended up having uh, the societies that we have? Uh, it was a gradual process in all of our countries. It didn't happen at once. Uh, it was also a deliberate choice uh, made by, by wise leaders at the time. Um, to, to look for the right direction that would, um, that would stabilize our societies in difficult times and, and create welfare societies. So I think comparing notes and, um, and obviously sharing um, both um, uh, the good lessons and also the bad lessons is something they appreciate most. But of course, we need to be able to support them in concrete terms also through development funding, uh, through expertise in, in governance and so on and so forth. So we words alone, of course, don't, um, don't uh, help enough. Just briefly, what do you think is the biggest lesson uh, that the Nordics learned? What is the biggest mistake, mistake the Nordics made? I think the biggest lesson we've learned, uh, certainly in, in Finland, and this was very long time ago, was the precisely the lesson that has been highlighted with Agenda 2030, leave no one behind. Uh, try to build societies where everybody has a stake, um, everybody feels uh, welcome, everybody uh, has a chance to education, healthcare, and is able to contribute to the society. I think that's the basis for trust, and, and that's, uh, that's an important lesson we've learned, and I think that's worth sharing with others as well. Mm. Janine, how do you how do you look at this? What do you think that Finland and Sweden can bring to the table for Africa? Well, partly we have to, of course, what Alina said is very important and, and uh, uh, a thing that we can, you know, you can lead by example also and, and be there uh, to, to, uh, to offer your uh, your last years of, of struggle in this area, because it always sounds like we are we are here and we've always been here, but of course not. In Sweden, we are now celebrating uh, this mandate period, 100 years of democracy. And that is because that was when, um, when women were allowed to vote. That was 100 years ago in Sweden. And the reason we, we got there, that we had the female vote, uh, was just because there was a threat of revolution. There was famine, people were starving, and there were rumors of a revolution. And then uh, the, the ruling party realized that they had to do something, and then they could to do just this. So it is small steps along 
the way. Uh, but we also, of course, have to be partners in that way that we listen to to what what they want, what they need, uh, what they see, and where we need to build their capacity, of course. And that is uh, uh, from everything to to the humanitarian, but also to building capacity, of course, and strengthen society. And and as I said uh, in my notes here, to uh, democracy is really one of the core things. But of course, also that uh, uh, we can uh, conflict is a, is a very big problem to building a sustainable society. Mm. Um, Gunvar also said that in her remarks that we need to decolonize aid and, and the discussion if aid is uh, is working and if it's made or uh, implemented in the right way has been been on the table a lot. And I just have an example. When I was I was in the DRC recently, and there were some some people there who told me that they're very frustrated with how NGOs there work. They arrange uh, events, people come there maybe because they're paid per DMs, they get reimbursement for traveling there, but then they say these events don't really help anything, they don't achieve anything, uh, they just swallow a lot of money, money that is often donated by, for instance, the Finnish and the Swedish governments. Uh, can you, Janine, give me some examples of how you're trying to break loose of these, these sort of not so good practices that have been in place for many years? How can that be changed? Uh, well, that is a good question. I think one of the answers is that we have to do longer commitments, that we do not uh, like project for project, and also that we evaluate the projects that we are doing, but that it also has to come from uh, a genuine interest from the people that are around. In what, what, what are they interested in? What do they want to learn? And of course, we can have projects that shows an example that if you uh, if you do like this, you have this result and, and you can build on an interest. But to, to more or less pay people to come and uh, take part is, I think, not a very good way to work. Uh, but we are very project-based and uh, we need to, to see how we can uh, extend, I think, funding and share um, uh, the successes all around and that we get a base and there I think it's very important this is also about cooperation and if Sweden and Finland can do more together or the Nordic countries and I think we really can do that if we exchange uh, more of what has been good practices and what has been bad. Mm. Elina, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of, of Finnish uh, NGOs and how they work and quite often there is like even if there is a lot of local staff on the ground who are implementing the decisions are coming higher from higher up and that is all often a very white uh, environment and a, like for instance the board members who are saying which projects should be done. How could Finland uh, do something about this problem? Uh, well, I think, Lisa, a lot. Um, it's first of all very good that you convey this kind of uh, messages uh, you've seen on the ground uh, among uh, people. Um, I think uh, there can be uh, there can be solutions. Uh, it has to be an inclusive process always, um, and uh, that is the principle. Actually, we recommend to to the NGOs also always uh, listening to the people themselves, uh, always being inclusive, always being needs-based, um, and also referring to your observation uh, on, on that um, particular event in, in uh, DCR. Um, I think we also try to uh, make sure there's long-term commitments, they need-based, and, um, and they also um, uh, planned um, in a process of supporting, for instance, in, in the national dialogue, supporting local communities um, in issues where they themselves feel they need help and support. Um, so I think if, if, if you made this observation, that's a good sign that, that um, uh, we need to do better. Mm. Then I'm thinking about, like now there's a lot of talk about Africa and EU being partners, but still also, also in this uh, brief uh, that was published after the last event in November, there was still talk of donor countries what do you think i mean can there be true partnership if one of the one of the, if one of the partner is the donor uh absolutely i think there is a very good uh, uh, 
that we can uh, because um, we shouldn't see it that way. I think this last year has really, really showed us that, that our, uh, our challenges are global and we're all in this together. And that is, uh, we tried to emphasize that in Agenda 2030 before, because that is a, 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 an agenda for the whole world. We have known it for a long time when it comes to climate change, and now we know it even more with the pandemic. And so we are really partners in this, and we have to do uh, the, the work together to achieve the goals. And I think if we have, uh, if it's a focus on that uh, issue, more than more than the money or the donor uh, relation, I think that we can really develop into this new world that uh, will emerge after uh, the pandemic. And I think that is a very important thing that we also move in that direction. Mm. And Elena, how do you view, I mean, Finland and Sweden are also quite different countries. For instance, when it comes to the size of the African diaspora, it's a lot bigger in in Sweden, and and that also affects, of course, the kind of policies uh, implemented in Finland and Sweden. What do you see? Like, can Finland and Sweden partner uh, in a in a way that is beneficial when it comes to partnering further on with with Africa? I think we can uh, partner, and I think we actually do partner, especially in countries where we active uh, both uh, both countries. I think there's a lot of comparing notes. There's a lot of coordination. There's also lots of uh, messages passed on together um, between Finland uh, and Sweden and, and the other Nordics. So the Nordics, uh, even together as a group, can send important messages, have important dialogues, and and um, have dialogues that actually help. Uh, the, the partner countries to to understand our points of view and and help us understand their points of view. I think we can do a lot. Mm. A quick follow up, actually, uh, picking up something that was asked here. For instance, when it comes to West Africa, Finland has very little presence in West Africa, mainly in, in East Africa, where Sweden is a lot bigger uh, than Finland in West Africa. How can you help each other on that part? Or why why is Finland not not really active in West Africa? Uh, I think we are a little bit more active in West Africa now. Uh, we lack embassies there, and the, there's been a discussion on where Finland actually should have embassies in Africa in the future. We should have more presence in Africa, that's that's very obvious. Uh, for historic reasons, we're more present in Eastern Africa. It's a language issue, um, partially, uh, and and a historic, uh, historic uh, trace. Uh, but um, we do have some crisis management contributions in Western Africa. We've given humanitarian support uh, to, to countries in, in Western Africa. We do have one very active embassy there and, uh, and we hope to have more over time. We also work a lot uh, through uh, multilateral agencies, not only the EU, but also multilaterals, uh, development banks like the African Development Bank, IFAT, which is very active in, in food security in Africa. And we do invest now more in, in Western Africa, um, for instance, with the loan and investment funds, and uh, for instance, through uh, an IFC climate fund, uh, which we have funded uh, since a few years. Uh, so there's lots of lots more um, going on actually in Western Africa, but we get news and, and information and uh, we, we share opinions and and views uh, with our Swedish friends, of course, uh, who are more present there. Mm. And at this point, it's my pleasure to welcome also Sandra Kremer into the discussion. Um, I hope you're with us, Sandra. And just quickly, um, did you do you have any thoughts on 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 the brief discussion we just have a, had about Finland and Sweden uh, contributing? Yes, hi, I hope you can hear me. I joined about five minutes later, um, but I uh, heard probably most of the discussion. So uh, good afternoon and thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am uh, the Director Africa in DG International Partnerships in the European Commission. Um, and um, I am from the Netherlands uh, originally, so maybe that's not really Nordic, although we probably see ourselves as uh, pretty Nordic uh, as well. 
Um, so I don't know if you want me to um, already say a little bit about how we uh, see our relations with Africa. Uh, I was actually thinking if you if you picked up on something that they were saying, is there something you'd like to comment, something you thought that was interesting or, or, or that you want to? Everything, everything. It's an interesting discussion. It is a really good discussion. And I heard a couple of things that I am completely in agreement with uh, uh, when you say we have to understand better and we have to have African solutions for African problems, ultimately. So I think it's uh, what, what you were saying is very important also on the focus on peace, on governance. Uh, uh, really, I have no, not heard anything that I don't, uh, that, that we don't, that I don't uh, agree with. Um, if, if I can say a few words, if you want, about how we in, uh, as a European Union as a whole are trying to work together to have more impact. Because the scale of Africa is just enormous. And you have said it also, Elina said it, you cannot, they, and, and Janine as well, you don't have embassies everywhere. Nobody has. Um, and it's the scale of the challenges and the scale of the enormity of the continent and the problems are, are huge. Um, and we face, all of us, uh, huge tensions in the world, a climate crisis, which, which was mentioned already. Um, there's rising inequality everywhere. We have digital uh, technology, di digital revolution, where there's also a dark side to the digital revolution. We have a health crisis, which was mentioned as well. And I think all that, um, we looked at uh, that in the European Commission, obviously, and then the commission under the uh, presidency of commission of President von der Leyen um, called this a geopolitical commission uh, a stronger Europe in the world is one of her themes really to have a more common stronger approach together and Africa is her strategic priority it is very clear uh, four days after getting into office she flew to Addis and she met with the leadership of the Africa Union and uh, we had a commission to commission meeting where we again flew to Addis and she, uh, Commission, uh, President von der Leyen, took uh, 23 European uh, commissioners with her. So all these are uh, commissioners in charge of um, particular fields and portfolios that we think are all important in our relations with Africa. We are uh, the closest neighbors. We are uh, natural partners. And um, President von der Leyen also gave a new name to the portfolio of my commissioner, which you know very well in this panel, and that is Jutta Erpilainen. And uh, Jutta Erpilainen's portfolio is called Commissioner for International Partnerships. And that's a really significant change. Really, it is about partnerships. Um, I think this has been discussed also uh, already in your discussions. What we want is a partnership on equal footings, equal uh, partnerships, and not to have the donor recipient thinking to to do away with that. That is very, very important. So the Commission for International Partnerships uh, suggested on the 9th of March a communication, which is a document which sets out our strategy uh, where we propose five partnerships with Africa. And you can briefly that, briefly say this, but then we want to go on with some questions. Yeah, so that's on on green transition, on digital transformation, on sustainable growth and jobs, on peace and governance, and on migration and mobility, and all this with cross cutting elements on youth, women, and of course education. And I think that uh, to come back to what was said before, we really have all of us a real common agenda, and we are looking at Team Europe initiatives. And I can see from my figures here that Sweden is active in 15 Team Europe initiatives across Africa and Finland, nine Team Europe initiatives across Africa. So you are playing a very important role in teaming up. So rather than all of us being dispersed and funding things left and right, we are focusing on transformational projects where we all work together. So this is what I would say uh, right now, and I can come back later uh, if you want, Lisa, a lot with more uh, input. Thanks.
Thank you. I want to ask you a question now. You mentioned migration and EU and migration together have gotten a bit of a negative, perhaps, connotation. Can there be, you're still talking about partnership, can there be truly a partnership between the EU and Africa if, uh, if like EU members can move freely into Africa, but Africans can't move freely into the EU? Yes, I think there can be a partnership, definitely, also on migration. There's many facets of migration. And what we've been doing over the years is uh, really tackling a lot of the root causes of why people want to leave and make a very dangerous journey into Africa and looking at job creation, at education, skills, and really vocational training and making sure that people get the perspective of a decent life in their own countries. But I think Elina said it just very well, actually. Partnership is what we all are because we all face common priorities and global challenges. So we all are um, looking at the same uh, climate and environmental uh, difficulties, digitalization, as I already put it. So in the light of the 2030 agenda, in the light of the Paris Agreement, we are all developing countries. We all have to have that one common agenda. So we are partners in this world. Yes. Uh, Elina, I want to, want to ask you, I feel there was uh, in many, many of your remarks, there was talk about corruption. And it's also been said that, uh, you know, the EU countries are one, first being very like condemning when it comes to corruption, but still cooperating with leaders that are corrupt in some African countries. Uh, how do you see this contradiction? Well, um, I don't think Finland is uh, cooperating with corrupt uh, leaders. I mean, when we fund projects for development, uh, we're very uh, strict on, on corruption. Um, we have a very uh, stringent planning system to avoid corruption monitoring system and even a press a button corrupt alarm arrangement where anybody who, who finds out uh, traces of corruption will press the button and, and the issue will be, will be looked at. Um, corruption, uh, I mean, we get lots of questions on how um, to avoid corruption um, um, in, in Global South um, because Finland is not corrupt, uh, that corrupt at all. Uh, the Nordics are not corrupt countries. We we top the the, the list of uh, of non corrupt countries, uh, but it is uh, very easy to give good advice. But if you have uh, corruption within the system, maybe as a part of sort of an informal salary system, it is not easy to to get rid of it at once. It's it's a long process. It need it needs lots of attention. It needs a lot of capacity and it will take time. But, uh, but I don't think um, uh, the message is unclear from us to, to, to the leaders of the countries we work with. that Corruption is unacceptable, of course. It's, it's, it's draining their funding system. It's undermining uh, the societies. And I, I, think, I think this is a very, very important issue and needs attention all the time. Mm -hmm. Janine, how do you then view like the EU's role when it comes to talking about corruption, for instance, compared to countries like China, uh, some Arab countries that are being active on the continent now who maybe don't put as much emphasis into fighting corruption or, or caring about human rights? How can the EU position itself when it comes to these countries? Well, the EU position has to be very clear as uh, the position from Finland and Sweden uh, and to, to be very, to, to always emphasize the importance of good governance, including robust institutions, rule of law, and anti-corruption is key to make a success. And to, uh, of, of course, development aid is one thing, but we all know after the, the financing for development agenda that we need more investment in these countries too, and we need private money. And if there are very much corruption, you lose so many possibilities to have uh, investments made, both from companies and, of course, uh, infrastructure projects, cultural projects and everything. So we need to, to show that this is a very important thing, both for us, as we need to really see that our money 
uh, comes to the right places where it's intended. Uh, but also, and even more so, for the countries that are suffering from this, because it really slows down the, the development in all the areas, of course, because money that should be used for, for development, uh, environmental or social, is, is going elsewhere. And it's a big problem. And we have to be very, very clear that that is not accepted. Mm. Um, you mentioned their investments and and also, I mean, the private sector is very important when it comes to partnering with, with Africa, but also uh, in some areas, for instance, mining in the DRC, DRC is one of the most corrupt countries, but there's also a lot of mining going on there and a lot of Nordic companies also involved there. Um, how can governments make sure that companies from their countries do not uh, promote corruption when they are operating in corrupt countries. Uh, how do you view this, Elena? Well, I think there's a very clear policy uh, about cor uh, corruption uh, and uh, corporate responsibility. Uh, we expect uh, the companies uh, to be responsible um, and not uh, add up to, to a corrupt system in, in, in any business area. Um, I think um, I think this is something where companies have learned over time, and and uh, this needs attention constantly. Uh, but this is also about uh, how uh, the countries uh, themselves have the capacity and the willingness uh, to get rid of corruption. So both uh, ends are needed: both the company responsibility and non-corrupt practices, and also um, the the administrative uh, contribution from the countries um, in, in question. I think, um, I think both, both ends need to, to work together. Mm. I still hear like there's uh, that you expect, but there is still like many examples where companies are also being corrupt. But Janine, you wanted to say something. Yes, I just want to add one thing because uh, just uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, it was clear that we, we are uh, on the EU level taking a, a, a broader grip on corporate responsibility with due diligence, uh, both social and ecological. And of course, that is an important step because we cannot control everyone with control mechanisms. We try, but we really need to have companies that really uh, take this seriously themselves and really want to live up to this. And uh, we hear at least from the Swedish companies that they are very they welcome this and see it as an important thing because they also want to they want to do good business, but they want to do it also in a good way. Mm -hmm. Sandra, yes, there was this big uh, or a very good step, I think, the corporate responsibility law that is is hopefully going to to come through in the in the EU. How do you uh, what is the EU doing so that this doesn't doesn't become sort of a, a patronizing um, towards Africa when when it comes to to how how the EU is dealing with Africa I'm still hearing like also in your language a bit of like uh, a bit of like underlying patronization you know we need to to show them how to how to do things in a good way so so my question to you Sandra is how how are you trying to get rid of this this patronization uh, yeah, I think it is indeed a very good uh, step forward, what Janine already said. And uh, to come back to the corruption, I think what is uh, important is to have also, apart from everything you said, uh, the monitoring, the good governance, the strong institutions, is also to make uh, digitalization part of it and to have lots of e-government services and to create transparency in that way to not pay salaries cash on the table, but pay it through uh, e-systems. This will definitely help also to tackle corruption. And then there's a lot of work on illicit financial flows going on. And those are massive financial flows, sometimes leaving the countries or the continent. And there we need to work internationally together as well. On uh, the corporate responsibility, very important. I think um, nobody here is in the business of patronizing. That is not what we are uh, after at all. Um, this is a partnership of equals, as I said. Uh, but what I think as Europeans we should look at and what we uh, can bring to the table is what makes us Europeans. And these are our values and our standards and the way we look at things. And I think sustainability is what we are uh, 
uh, you know, what the, I think what, what makes us different from others in the world, sustainability in terms of environment, but also social, financial, political, international, that is what we what makes it different. To put it very simply, if we're going to uh, implement a project or, or finance something, there will be an environmental impact assessment. There will also be a social impact assessment. How many people will be educated? How many people will be employed? Um, there will be a financial impact assessment. So the European uh, values, if you want, that is what we bring to the table. And that should make us, including democracy, human rights, uh, anti-corruption, as we were discussing now, that is what makes us, I think, uh, different. And that, that would be my, my answer to your question, Lisa Lott. Mm. And how do you, what, now in, in your work, Sandra, what is the biggest lesson that you have learned from, from Africa? What is the, the greatest lesson that you've learned and that you want to take with you to the EU? Well, I learn every day. And what I learn is, of course, um, what they uh, say, if uh, you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And I think that is a very important lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to go far. We want to have this very strong partnership with a very strong and important partner that we have in the world to be long lasting and to be really uh, footed on the sustainability issues that I just described. So that would be my lesson, but it is a pleasure every day uh, to work with such a variety of, of people and cultures and languages. And uh, it is also a pleasure to see us uh, interlinked more and more. It is just now very difficult in these uh, global pandemic times that we cannot travel, we cannot see each other. We see all of you now on the screen, but I'm dealing every day with uh, seeing my uh, partners in Africa on the screens. And so my frustration for the moment is that uh, it is impossible now to, to actually see each other. Uh, but I think there is a, an enormous amount of work that we are going to do. And as soon as I, we hopefully get out of this crisis, um, we, will, uh, we will pick up also the, the real meeting, huh? the real uh, exchanges again. What about you, Janine? Do you have, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned from Africa? I think uh, the biggest lesson is the enthusiasm and um, at least before the pandemic, but also I, I was on a visit to Kenya uh, two weeks ago, uh, a digital uh, study tour. Uh, and, and, and this is still there. Uh, I mean, the enthusiasm, the will to build a good future, all the young people really believing that if they work hard, they can have a better future. And I think that enthusiasm in, among uh, the children and young people is something that we really need to, to get hold on and, and continue to, to help to evolve. Because, of course, in these dire times, it's easy to be, uh, to be a bit down <laughs> instead of... of uh, so we really need to put uh, to, to, to get hold of that and and um, and help that to to continue to be there because that is probably the best and most important asset that there is. Mm. What about you, Elena? What can Finland learn from from Africa? Well, I think um, what I've learned at least from Africa is that partnership is not an empty word. It's uh, it's an important word, and and there's lots of willingness uh, to partner, and uh, it's based on 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 the fact that actually we share many interests, we share many uh, visions, um, and we share a common future. I think there's very good grounds to talk about partnership, and as somebody mentioned in the written comments, we can also learn a lot from Africa in terms of creativity in terms of enthusiasm, in, in terms of thinking um, differently, uh, also uh, thinking, thinking in a new way. This is absolutely a two-way partnership. I think we need to underline that. Mm. We still have a little bit of time and I want to, to ask one question still to you, Sandra, when we talked about migration, some of the biggest partners with, with um, Europe are, for instance, countries like, like Sudan, like Ethiopia, 
And we are actually currently seeing a lot of tensions in the Horn of Africa between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Also, these are big questions. There is uh, the dam project in Ethiopia, which is trying to address uh, climate change and electrification, which is a huge uh, or crucial for development in the area. But how could EU be a partner when it comes to these tensions and try to help help solve solve problems in the area? Yes, you are right. There are uh, many uh, tensions for the moment and the uh, European Union, but of course, uh, this is beyond Commissioner Erpilainen's uh, portfolio. This is a portfolio which is um, uh, in the hands of ministers of foreign affairs. And I think the European Union is trying to, uh, as much as possible, uh, help uh, the, the, the region uh, out of this crisis. I think we have done a lot, uh, quite a lot immediately uh, on the COVID uh, crisis, and we are also now helping a lot on the humanitarian crisis that are ta is taking place specifically in the Tigray province. There is now a lot of more improved access, and that is a very good news. Um, and of course, the European Union has um, uh, had an envoy going there, who you also know very well, which was is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Finland, Mr. Havisto, and he made a really good round uh, past all the key players in this uh, region. And so what the European Union does in the uh, context of Mr. Havisto's visit is to make sure that we as much as possible uh, help uh, our African partners to uh, leave this behind as soon as possible. So yes, we are very much focused on that and very much uh, hoping that this situation uh, improves very quickly. Mm. Now we are almost running out of time, but I still want to have a brief remarks from you. Uh, first, Elina, what is, um, uh, in your opinion, the biggest mistakes that the EU has made or Finland has made when it comes to, to partnering with Africa? What, where could we do better? Well, I think in the old times, uh, we didn't talk about partnership. We wanted to help. It was absolutely well-meaning activities we had in Africa, but maybe not always listening uh, carefully enough uh, uh, to our African partners, defining the, the needs uh, and in particular uh, defining the sustainability of, of what we did. There were separate well-meaning activities a little bit here and there. I think we're much more strategic now. We aim at, at, at a better systemic change uh, in, in our development cooperation. Um, I think uh, the EU um, is a multifaceted agency with member states, with different institutions. Maybe what the EU could do better is, is to be seen as the EU, as, as uh, representing uh, its member states and everybody working together and uh, actually showing off what it is doing because i think this is this is not this hasn't been clear to to everyone even if the the europeans have done a lot and janine what do you think are the biggest mistakes that have been done well apart from that <clears throat> what uh, elena said i think also that we have uh, not put in so much effort into the visibility uh, of course it should be uh, demand driven development uh, and cooperation and and but we also need to show that we are there and that we are uh, a partner uh, in these issues. And I think we have we have not done that enough now when we realize that others that are uh, having their interests in, in Africa are much more showing. And uh, as I said, as Alina said too, it was this, we need to be more demand driven than we have been in the past. Uh, but we also have to show that we are a, a good partner and that we want to be a partner uh, in the future for a long, for a long time. Thank you so much. Uh, Therese from the Nordic Africa Institute, wh what are your thoughts after hearing this discussion? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, panelists. Uh, 
uh, it has been very interesting to follow the conversation. And I just want to emphasize again that this seminar follows on the previous one in November when we brought together African thought leaders and scholars and, and European thought leaders to discuss the Nordic's role in relation to the EU-Africa partnership. A few dimensions just to emphasize uh, today uh, that is also worth bringing forward in the future conversation on this topic is that all the panelists have stressed that we we face joint complex problems. The world is interconnected and interdependent. And that mutual interest must guide the future partnership between the European Union and Africa. Now, I think all, both Janine and Elena has touched upon how can Sweden and Finland bring that forward so that we see an inclusive, just and fair partnership with Africa. One thing finally that I'd like to emphasize is that um, all the panelists have talked about sharing lessons learned. And in that context, I think it's important to really stress how important co-creating that knowledge together with uh, African views knowledge uh, is at the very center to bring that this partnership forward. So with those few summarizing words, I'd like to thank of course, the panelists, the moderator, the audience who attended today, and also Han Holm and Culture Center for um, bringing us where we are today. And please make sure that you follow us in our continued series of conversations on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much also uh, on my behalf, and I'm sorry if I was jumping through very big themes and only touching on them briefly, there was so much I wanted to discuss. And as I said, we could probably have go on, gone on for another hour easily. And maybe next time, yeah, we can hear more, more about also, also what Africa can, can bring to the table for, for Europe as, as was asked there in the comments. And there were a lot of very good comments. I'm sorry that I couldn't pick up on, on all of them that were posted there, but I'm sure they will be read. But thank you so much to all of you and hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.